I'm Cassidy, and I'm here with Natalie Hennig for, with Joseph D. Lett CPA. And Andrew Feldman. And we're super excited we're getting prepped and ready for the tax class exactly one week from today on September 11th. We'll be here at the office. <laughs> Uh, my name is Andrew Feldman. Uh, I have a company called Legacy Wealth Partners. Uh, we're a financial planning firm. We do investment management services and uh, financial plans. I'm Natalie Hennig with Joseph D. Lutz CPA. We are a CPA firm, family owned, that's been in business for 40 years, and we do everything tax related. I'm Cassie Benson. I own Living Room Real Estate. And I wish Taylor was here tonight. So my associate Taylor is actually in the hospital, has a kidney stone maybe or something. Um, but so it's Taylor and I. I opened the brokerage earlier this year, and um, I focus on investment-minded uh, millennials buying in city center <coughs> neighborhoods. Is kind of like my focus area, and. This is my actual financial planner and my CPA. I have a lot of confidence in them and I really search to find um, professionals to work with and these guys are outstanding. Thanks, Cassidy. We are awesome. <laughs> um, and then everyone in this room is, is pretty amazing too because when I was thinking about doing a tax class, I was like, oh, it's kind of a dry topic. I don't know if anyone's no, gonna. It's so fun. <laughs> it's day. Like, who's gonna come to this class? And it's really people like you. Like, it, you're dedicated to learning, and I appreciate you being here. Um, so, first to start out with, like, is there any particular reason that you guys came? Anything that you want to get out of tonight? Save money. Yeah. Save some money. Get okay. over the IRS. All right. <laughs> Smarter with our taxes. Be a little smarter with your taxes. Anything specific that you're uh, learning about Airbnb taxes? Airbnb taxes? Okay, cool. We'll be talking a little bit about that. Awesome. Um, since we are going to be talking a lot about taxes, we're going to kind of divide this up, this room up into the way the IRS sees you guys. So the purpose of the class, this is the agenda. I don't have it memorized, but we wanted to go over. Uh, different opportunities if you are a primary homeowner, an investor in real estate, um, if you're using your primary home as an investment, like an Airbnb or some situation like that, or if you're looking to use your retirement ca account to own direct investment real estate. Uh, we want to cover depreciation, that's a big part of this. 1031 uh, is a tax code that allows you to defer taxes, so we'll talk more about that. Um, if you don't see something on this page that you're interested in us discussing, please shout it out or, or let us know at any time. I think that we can help kind of in any area, but these are the topics that at least came to mind when we were preparing for today. Um, I got really into real estate and learning about the tax code when I read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And um, what Kiyosaki really talks about in that book is originally taxes were proposed as the Robin Hood. So take from the rich and give to the poor and create some equality in our society, which is something that everyone can really get a, get behind. Um, amendment 16, the 16th Amendment was passed, and that's really how it was sold to people, that we're taking from the rich and giving to the poor. But what actually ended up happening was the opposite, is that um, most rich people have enough money and uh, political power, lobbying power, and knowledge that they can really take advantage of the tax system and so they actually end up paying a lot less than the average person and so the poor and middle class um, they don't really understand the system and they end up take you know paying a lot of the taxes um, so in 2018 we had one of the biggest changes in the tax law definitely since i've been practicing i think um one that could compare would have been about 1988 so tax changes like this don't happen happen often, and it's easy to see why, right? Because then you have to get all of the Senate and the House together and agree on those tax changes. And so it's probably not gonna happen again for a long time either. 
The biggest change to in 2018 was the standard deduction. So 2017 and prior, standard deduction for a single person was approximately $6,000, married people $12,000. That doubled. It went from $12,000 single to twenty up to $24,000 for a married couple. And then a huge one that we see a lot of people get affected by is the real estate and state income tax. So previously, you could deduct all of your real estate tax and all of your state income tax. We have a client, lives in Chicago, works at Morgan Stanley, makes a lot of money. His state income tax was $60,000. His real estate taxes in Chicago, super high, were $30,000. So he got every year a $90,000 deduction for those items. Now he's limited to 10. Luckily, most of us in Colorado have lower state income tax, and we really have low real estate taxes. But for high earners, we're definitely seeing them um, get limited by that $10,000 limitation. If you have multiple homes. If you have multiple homes, that does still apply. So a second home, the taxes would be filed in along with your primary residence real estate taxes. Real estate taxes are, I mean, real estate for rental are completely separate. They aren't subject to this limit. Second homes and primary residences are. If you guys have questions, please, we want you to ask them. Yeah. Um, so Colorado <coughs> has one, one of the lowest uh, like real estate taxes. Who's from a state that has really high real estate taxes? Okay, do you know, uh, oh. Jersey. 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 Yeah, I'm from New Jersey too, it's crazy. Go back. Yep. <laughs> Jersey has the <laughs> highest real estate taxes. <coughs> Okay, so there's basically two ways that you reduce your taxes. One is a deduction. So the standard deduction that we talked about is a deduction. Your mortgage interest, real estate taxes, state income tax, charitable donations are a deduction. So what that means is it reduces your taxable income. So for example, we have someone who earns $50,000 on their W-2 they don't own a home for simplicity. They get the $12,000 standard deduction, right? So 50 minus 12,000, their taxable income is 38,000. So if we go over to our tax brackets, if this person is single, right? They fall into the 12% bracket, $9,000 of income to 38,000. So their tax, we go to Cassidy's lovely board here, so they're not taxed on the full 12% on all of their income. The tax brackets are segregated, so they go up. So the first 10%, I mean the first 9,000 is on 10%, the next 38,000 to 9,000 is on 12%, etc. Does that make sense? So like, <coughs> if you're in that, that first bracket, So if you only make $9,000, this 10%. 10%. Your Is income in before deduction. So we're using the example after the deduction. And yes, this is your taxable income. So this is after all your deductions, where you fall. So in our example, somebody makes 38,000, their tax, yep, is over there $4,400 because it's this line plus this line right. equals their total tax. Right. So then we did the percentage. So they're getting, they're getting. If you take their full. Okay, so off of the fifty thousand dollars that this person earned, they were taxed on thirty-eight thousand, which is the twelve percent bracket. But not all of that money is taxed at twelve percent. Some of it's also taxed at ten percent. Uh, so that comes out to about eleven and a half percent there. <laughs> but off their total income, the fifty. Forty-four fifty-two is eight point nine percent of fifty thousand dollars. So. When you say, hey, I'm making this much money, first of all, let's just, to make it more drastic, let's say you make $210,000 as a single person. Not all 200,010 is taxed at 35. It graduates system to system. So, so like 10,000 in your example would be taxed at the 35% bracket. Correct. So for this $50,000 or $50,000 income, taxable income is 38, and it has an adjusted tax rate of 8.9%. Does this make sense? Is does it, does anyone want to humor me and figure out their tax, how much, <laughs> their percentage of taxes they're paying? 
Yeah. Like a no. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we're gonna just do the math and then everyone can figure it out. I would, but I'm basically the screen. So, <laughs> so we did it for you. Awesome. Fantastic. So I mean, basically, yeah. So these are these are marginal tax brackets, right? Is how these are defined. Yeah. So it's like, as you, if you make a hundred thousand dollars. The first ninety five hundred gets dropped in the first. So we have bucket. like a nice little and then the next summary up there. Fit twenty thousand there gets dropped in the second bucket, and then you just yeah. keep going until you're out of money, and that's yeah. how you figure out your taxes. Yeah. So say that you made like five hundred thousand, then you would just add up all these numbers. Which we didn't do the five hundred. Yeah, and that's how much you pay, and then you would divide it by your total right five. Yeah. But some people think if you start making 157501, you're then paying 32% on all of your taxes. Which right, is which not is not right. correct. No, so not people right. are like, I don't want to make more money, I'm going to have to pay more taxes, which is a constant thing I hear in my business. I mean, in, in this example, right, $50,000, this person's paying 9%. I mean, with the 2018 tax law, taxes are crazy low. This is literally the lowest they've ever been. So is this graduated system new to No, okay. always been in place gotcha. since I started. <laughs> I don't know when it got in place, but that's always been the case, right? But what happened with the Trump tax plan is first of all, the, the highest bracket was 39%. That bracket's gone. The 37 and 35% brackets were bigger, meaning you started off maybe at 300,000 in 2017. Now it's gone up to 400,000. So if you make, 350 you're not going to you're not going to pay 35 percent where you would have previously any questions before we move on to this do you know where the 32 percent tax bracket fell for the changes come on, well, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no i don't i don't recall <laughs> yeah do you have a phone right there's wi-fi here um, <laughs> 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 so one thing uh, that's different than a deduction is a credit so there's there's also something called a tax credit which is not to be confused with the deduction so credits now like if you have a child you get two thousand dollars a year um, there's a caregiver's credit um, an electric car those things give you a credit right so a credit directly reduces your tax so here this is the standard deduction reduce your income if you have our four thousand dollars of income of tax over there and then you also have a kid your in your tax is going to drop by two thousand dollars so just twenty four fifty two uh, because that's all they cost right is two thousand dollars it's not worth it it's not worth it so worth it <laughs> but realistically right you're given this standard deduction regardless of your life situation in most cases with the credits right college Caregiving, daycare, electric car, you're paying for something. What, how did you explain it, Andy, Andrew? Deduc deductions reduce your taxable income and credits are a gift, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. uh, so the tax code, you can play with with a good accountant to, to reduce your income in, in a legal manner. It, certain lifestyle choices may just get a credit back to you. Okay. Oh, we're gonna skip this. Okay, sorry. It's coming up later. Was it you or me? Cool. Okay. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, before we move on from the tax credits, like I, and maybe it's a lot easier than I think it is, but like how would you calculate the value of that two thousand dollar tax credit? Because it's obviously <laughs> not two thousand dollars, right? Like no. and it's Oh, new. in this scenario, it's a, it's if this if this person had sorry, in literal numbers it's worth two thousand dollars. So oh, okay. if that person had a child like in this, this fifty thousand dollar example, they paid two thousand four hundred and fifty two dollars. Oh wow. It directly okay. reduces their tax. Okay. Direct. Right. Probably Mine was a little bit more of a worldly. <laughs> <laughs> so that probably drop their. They probably drop their the percentage to like. They cut it off on children. Four kids. Four kids is the max. No benefit for the fish. Keep going. No. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, sorry. When they get cut off at eighteen, right? Seventeen now. Oh, really? So at seventeen, when they turn seventeen, you still get the two thousand dollars. The year they turn eighteen, you get five hundred. Okay. So previously, right, we used to get an exemption, which was $4,000 approximately for every person you claimed on your return. Now let's say your kid is 19, they're going to college. 
pre previous tax law, you could take them as a deduction still. Let's be real, you're paying for their college, you're paying for their living expenses. Now when they turn 19, they basically have no benefit to you. Is that with the Trump tax cuts then? Correct. Why? Well, so they wanted to simplify and try and make it more fair. Originally, they had no child tax credit too. But if you remember, like tons of pro protesting, so they were gonna take out the exemptions, that was gone. And then they wanted to only leave the child tax credit the same at $1,000. And people were like, come on, we can't afford to live if we don't get some sort of break for our kids. So they brought it up to 2000 But the exemptions, they were taken out. Okay, cool. So the IRS is really going to categorize real estate in, um, there's four different buckets. <coughs> so, of course, your primary residence, right? You must live there. Definitely, when you do live there and you sell it, best tax advantage. A second home is something you don't rent. So if you do rent it 14 days a year, there's like this special tax law. If you rent it 14 days or less, you don't have to claim the income, don't have to depreciate the property. Cool, it can be a second home. Investment properties are basically anything that you rent over 14 days, required to depreciate it, can take expenses. And then short-term capital gains are something, a property that you own for one year or less and you sell it unless you're forking it. Any questions about the different categories? Your capital gains exemption is when you live in it for three years, is that what? And did not ever rent it before. Did not ever rent it before. Yeah. Yep. Even Airbnb. Yeah, because you have to depreciate it. Mm -hmm. okay. Wait, so, so you said unless you flip it? If so, you flip sorry, it. Sorry, I, I cut you off there. No, uh, so on the Airbnb, you know, you're basically treating that portion of your home as an investment property. We'll get into that. Yeah, and then if you flip it, we'll talk about that too, but that's self-employment income. So no capital gains treated there. Right. So the biggest thing for, um, for most of my clients is that owning your primary residence, there's no capital gains on the profit. So as an individual, you can make up to $250,000. Uh, like, so your house, say that you bought it, for 250,000, it appreciates to a half million. When you go to sell it, you'd pay no taxes on that gain. So that's a really rare tax exemption. It's, it's huge. It's very big for a lot of people. Um, and then as a married couple, you can make uh, half or half million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. So um, that's a really huge deduction. I know this one older woman who literally got married because her house in Wash Park appreciated so much that she wanted to take the full half. <laughs> <laughs> and got divorced the next year or what? Well, they had been together for a long time. They just made it official for the tax. Oh, nice. um, the other big thing is that mortgage interest deduction. So uh, for me, this was familiar because I took the interest deduction on my college uh, loans. So if you're familiar with that, it's just, it works the same way. And then he locks this this recently changed with the 2018 tax law but you can deduct that interest if it's a su substantial improvement or a purchase of a home otherwise it's not tax deductible. there's a big opportunity there too anyone that might have a HELOC on their property especially if it's become an investment property prior to the new tax code change it'd be in your best interest to keep that HELOC open and continues to be deductible that's true if you had it before November 1st of 2017 but after that, it's now only if it's substantial improvement. Correct. It sounds pretty subjective. Yeah. I mean, I didn't make the law. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to check. It was pushed through late night. <laughs> They're trying to limit. I mean, so, you know, obviously I have my own opinion, but they changed those tax brackets, right? They got rid of the 39%, make, made the brackets bigger. So they're trying to limit what people can take as an itemized deduction to somehow offset how much they limited those tax brackets. I think there was a question. Yeah, you had a question, Julie? Yeah, so we took out a bridge loan, which is HELOC, on the paperwork. And now that bridge loan sits at the address that is now a rental. So that's a great point. So if you take a HELOC out on a rental, it's always deductible. But not on your primary. As the business. 
Right. right. As a rental expense, basically. Mm -hmm. All right. Wait. Sorry, what is HELOC? A uh, home equity line of credit. Okay. So if you have a lot of equity in your house, you can <coughs> use the HELOC to pull that. But you can't use it on another house. You actually can. You could buy a rental property with it, and then it would be deductible on the rental. You could buy a second home with it, be deductible on Schedule A. No, that's your, that's your Up to seven hundred fifty thousand. So you, let's, you, let's clarify. Let's property that's appreciated more than your current home. If you want to improve your current home, you can take a HELOC on your own property. I mean, in that case, right? We'd probably just put it on the Schedule A because that would qualify as a substantial improvement. Baxter, it's really hard to pull a HELOC on an investment property. It's a much higher interest rate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. to, to be clear, this is this is speaking the primary where yep. unless it's substantial improvement, you can't use it as a tax write-off. Whereas right. if you if you get the HELOC on a rental, then it is a tax right. write-off. And like before 2018, right, I could take out a HELOC on my house and send my daughter to college, go on a trip around the world, pay off my credit cards. It was all deductible. So that's the new portion. Uh, one of the biggest um, confusions is that improvements on your primary residence are not a deduction. Does anyone, does anyone misconceptions about that? So if you're going to remodel your kitchen or do anything, it's not a deduction. You're, that's all. But if you take it, you lock out the interest on that. Would be Correct. The interest, yeah. but not the actual improvements. Right. And I that think you had a question for a while. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I had a HELOC on a house that was my primary residence. Now it's not. So right now, off? anything I use it for, just the interest is deductible? Like if I made an improvement on my primary off of the... Yeah, HELOC but like I said, that's kind of what he said. We'd probably put that on your primary because that's allowed on the as a primary residence on the Schedule A deduction. Oh. Yeah, I mean, in theory, it's secured on the rental property, right? I mean, if you don't pay the loan, they're taking your rental property. So it's an expense of the rental. And I mean, realistically, what are we talking on interest on HELOCs a year? $3,000, I mean, at the most. And like Cassidy said, taking out a HELOC on your rental, I mean, it's a lot harder than doing it on your primary. But they, you did it when it was your primary. Yeah, and we right. kind of bought the current house using that. With the rental or the new house? The new house. So I probably use that as the Schedule A deduction, right? That's basically regular mortgage interest. Wouldn't it be more advantageous to deduct all of it and keep it as a business expense? In some cases, yeah. Depending on what your standard deduction is. The thing about taxes that I learned when I was making this presentation, it all depends on your situation. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> That's true. I probably told her that like 20 times. <laughs> Cassie, I have a question yeah. on the remodel. <coughs> um, so like obviously you're not saving your receipts on a remodel for your end of year deductions, but can't you utilize those those expenses then when you go on to sell the house if your capital gains are over 250? Yes. Okay, okay, so you are saving those. So yes, receipts. you should save them. Okay. That basically adds to Great your point. purchase price of your home. So if you had three hundred thousand dollars of profit and you're single and fifty thousand of improvements, that'd bring you down under the two fifty. Wow, you're you got it. I got one more question on the last side. So the, when you have to live in the house for three out of five years, can you do anything with the house including rent it out for five no. three? No. For Not to keep the exclusion. No, so if you rent it out then so basically how it works is if you own, if you bought a property in 2014, that'd be five years ago, you lived in it for two years and then you moved out and rented it for three and you wanna sell it now in 2019, you, it's based on a percentage. So you'd get, I think that'd be 40% of the total sale would be not subject to capital gains. Cause that's the two, the time that you lived in it out of five years. But the whole thing is not tax-free. It's a huge misconception that I have to deal with with clients all the time. So they take the proportionate amount that you didn't rent it out? So realistically, own. right, if you own a property, you've owned it for, you lived in it for four years, you're renting it for one and you want to sell it, that'd be the best time. Because you have a lot more time that you lived in it. Now, if you lived in the house like 20 years and you rented it for one, you're gonna have super low capital gain, but you will still have some. What if you live in half the house and rent the other half? But it's one to two. Hold, please. Hold. We're coming to that. Uh, am I doing? 
I think this is answered. <laughs> just answer the guy's question. You've been uh, awfully quiet. <laughs> uh, this is, well, I think I've gotten into a little bit more detail in this now, I think. But what, what we're trying to show here is if you're taking the standard deduction of your real estate purchase or if you're going to itemize. Um, in this first example, <laughs> we're showing a purchase price of $400,000. So none of this deals with the sale of the property. This is just back to the tax return. On a purchase of 400K, um, we don't have the interest rate up there, but we're assuming that you paid 14,560 in interest. That amount is $2,500, $2,560 over the 12K single person deduction. This would be an example of if you are single in this home scenario, you'd already be itemizing your deductions. Your, your mortgage interest is higher than what the government is offering you as the standard. So here, this is an example of real estate is working for you against the tax code. If you didn't own this property, you'd have a $12,000 standard deduction. This interest rate on 400K, or at least the purchase price, whatever the mortgage is, that mortgage interest has created an opportunity where you now are deducting more than what is standard through the ownership of real estate. So it's an example of how it's beneficial to own real estate. Um, example two, we upped the price to $800,000, uh, almost $4,000 a month in interest, which just seems high. Um, it's still a single person, so here, well, I, I think the point here is that at, for a single person with an $800,000 home, you're actually getting $17,000 in deductions as a married person in the same scenario would only get $5,000 of increased deduction from what is standardized. Uh, we often hear real estate's a good tax play as the standard deduction has been increased and we've lost the opportunity to, to have other taxes deducted in certain scenarios, that's on our first slide. Uh, here's an example basically where, where things do work. But as deductions have come up, standardized deductions, the opportunity in real estate as a tax benefit has come down slightly. So I get this a question all the time. Like, is it is buying a house a good deduct like good for your taxes? And it totally depends on your situation because if you're a if you're a single person and you bought that eight hundred thousand dollar house, like that is a huge benefit. But even as a married couple, like five thousand a five thousand dollar deduction isn't that Big, you know, and the, not the, if you're buying eight hundred thousand dollars in real estate. Yeah, right. And if you um, prior to the change, when it was just a, a, the standard deduction was six thousand, pretty much anyone who owned a house was going to pay at least six thousand dollars in interest. So this is a huge change, and actually, like, de incentivizes home ownership a little bit. So it's one or the other. You can't take the standard deduction and itemize your mortgage, or you can do both. Correct, one or the other, you, you have to choose. And that's what TurboTax kind of does, is it's gonna ask you all those questions to figure out which one's gonna be best for you, if you kind of think about it like that, and then they are gonna tell you which route to go. You're always gonna get whatever's higher, right? So if you're married and you're this person, 14,000, well, the 24,000's higher, you're gonna take that. Any other questions about this? So this is something that I really talk to my clients about because it's also about leverage. So if you invested the um, fifty thousand dollars into the market, like this stockbroker or something, um, you're and that investment's going to appreciate by five percent. You're going to make twenty five hundred dollars that year, and you're not living there. You, have, you don't have a roof over your head. And then when you go to sell that investment, you're going to pay twenty to twenty five percent. So the big difference in real estate is once it's leveraged, um, the same money, $50,000, and say that you bought a house for 500, then your return, if that appreciated by 5%, is $25,000. So you also have a place to live, which is mostly why people buy houses. Um, and then you're, when you go to sell that, you're paying zero because um, you get the capital gains exception as your primary residence. It makes a very convincing point, but Andrew had Andrew's like if you borrow four fifths of the money and it goes the other way, mm -hmm. it goes down. It doesn't work out very well for you. Yeah, if it goes, yeah, if the market doesn't appreciate. Yeah, so I think here that if, if you earn five percent income mm -hmm. off your investment, you'll have twenty five hundred bucks a year. If you earn five percent on a one to five leveraged asset, it'll go up five times more. Um, but if it goes down, 
it'll go down five times faster. But what's the average appreciation per year in Colorado? Well, it's, I mean, historically, the whole housing market's been appreciating at like 5%, but Colorado's been closer to like 8 to Is that taking into account 2008, 9, 10? She said last few years. Oh, last few years. <laughs> yeah, last I wasn't year. sure if you were saying holistically where we're at. Yeah, <laughs> since the market got really good, we're, okay. we've been definitely over 5% appreciation per year. It's okay. almost been a 50% since, 50% increase since the market turned. What's the current capital gain rate? 15% federal, five Colorado, if you're under 400,000 single or 450 married. Over those two numbers, 20% federal, five Colorado. Oh, so that includes the state? There's always an if, yes. Okay, yeah. like, that's not exactly. right at all. Because right. you do still pay state income tax on that. So it's really important in your head that you think about your primary residence completely different than an investment property because they are taxed in completely different ways. So if it's your primary, you live there, you can also take a lower down payment when you purchase the property. Um, what, you know, you can do as little as three and a half percent down versus an investment property where you're gonna have to do 20 to 25% down. You take the interest deduction, this example's for 500,000, um, and then you, you don't have to pay capital gains, depending if you're married or single. Right. Um, and then your investment gets broken down a totally different way. So you can turn a primary residence into an investment. But they're, they're going to be categorized differently once that becomes a rental. Right. You can write off any expenses for an investment property. This is driving there, any improvements, whatever, you know, other. We'll go into the list. Yeah, we'll go into that. And then you can depreciate it, which we're going to go into because it's a little more complicated. And you can also, you'll either have to pay capital gains or you can do a 1031 exchange. So we're going to go into all this. So an investment property basically is a separate business. I mean, I work with a lot of lawyers and kind of the thing that they're suggesting is your rental property should be in a separate LLC. Like, yeah, you can have a liability policy for a million dollars, but that's just gonna cover your legal fees. If someone wants to, if someone slips and falls at your rental, your legal fees might be covered, but your primary residence, your 401k, your income that you're earning, your job could be kind of subject to that lawsuit. So it should be in a separate LLC and treated like a business. It should have a separate bank account. Everyone rolls their eyes at me when I say that, but realistically, that's just adding in another layer of protection. And so you can ex expense all money that you spend for the property. So if it's an Airbnb and you, you furnish it, those are expenses. If you have supplies, if you have towels, toilet paper, all that stuff is all expense. If you advertise for the property to be rented, that's an expense. Like Cassidy said, going to the property and back can be a mileage expense. Um, what else? Paying your kids, you can pay them under $600 a year. Meals and entertainment. I mean, if you're going out with your spouse, talking about the rental, if you're going to look at a rental property and have a meal there, that can be deducted. You can do a home office, so you can take a percentage of your home as a deduction for the rental property for you know keeping track of the expenses, doing the paperwork, sending out leases, collecting rents, all of that stuff. Um, utilities, of course, if you have an Airbnb and you're paying utilities, I mean, basically, everything's for that. That's so, implying paying your kid for <coughs> labor. Yeah. Just like, get them to, like, clean the yard. Like, mow the lawn. It's, like, a really good example. Yeah. Um, what about, so, we, have, we, we use the home office deduction as well. We, for a business? Yes. For our LLC uh, rental property. Okay. Um, but not for, like, your own self-employment income. Beautiful. No. Yeah, you could do both. I mean, it's much more advantageous against your self-employment income if you have that. But go ahead. So yeah, so we use it for the LLC for our, our rental property. Right. But we use internet at home. That's mm -hmm. also obviously for our business. Right. How does that work? You know, we also have, but that's through Comcast, which is also cable. So how does that right. work? Do you deduct that or do you 
So the home office is basically all expenses of the home and taking your percentage. Okay. So that's internet, cable, security, HOA, insurance, oh, cleaning so person, law person. All expenses of the house and taking a percentage yes. of that. For her. Exactly. Okay. Percentage based on what? Square footage. Square footage. So you need to have a separate office. It needs to be used on a regular basis. Shouldn't be the dining room table. Needs to be a separate space. And you can include like sheds and stuff too, right? If you store stuff there. Yeah, sheds, garage, basement. Okay, but you take the whole cost of your house. Right. And then deduct based on percentage. the percentage. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. So going back to this, so when you sell your real estate property, there's basically two taxes on it. So one, you depreciate the property every year, right? So you take the cost of the property divided by 27.5 years, and you get that as an expense every year. That's required by the IRS. You can't choose to not depreciate it. I mean, you can, but you're going to be sad when you sell it because you have to recapture depreciation as if it was taken, even if you didn't take it. When you sell the property, that all comes back in as income. All that depreciation taxed at 25%. Then in addition to that, you have capital gains on the increased value. So let's say you buy your property for $100,000, you depreciate it for five years. The basis is now $50,000. You sell it for 200. You bought it for 100, right? Depreciate it down. Your profit is 150. So that depreciation drops your new basis. You're going to pay capital gains on 150,000. If that makes sense. What's the depreciation do for you in the meantime? So you get that as an expense every year. So in my example, you depreciate $10,000 for five years. You get a $10,000 expense every year. As long as you own the property? As long as you rent it. Yes. Are there tax deductions if you were to take the equity that you earn from the sale of your home and put use that as a down payment to purchase another property? In so that's area? a super old rule that went out in about the 80s. So that's no longer the case. Okay. So you cannot, so that what they did is put the capital gain exclusion in instead. So you can't sell your home for 500000 and buy a million dollar house and not have any tax consequences. That doesn't exist anymore. But if yeah. you... <coughs> so if you, you're depreciating for all those years and you get a tax benefit from it, and in the end you turn around and pay capital gains on it, isn't it kind of a wash? I mean, yeah. What's the point? <laughs> when would you rather pay taxes? Now or later? later. So and you when you taxes, sell it, that's when you have the money. Right? That's when you have the cash. But after 27 and a half years, you can no longer claim that. Well, in theory, right, it'd be all done. It'd be all depreciated because you take the same amount every year for 27 and a half years. What kind of tax return? Do you, okay. do you then this pay is, yeah, is, those taxes on your bracket when you say at that point? Or is it so it's 25%. Flat, flat line no matter what your bracket the is. I mean, for now, right? Okay. <laughs> until we get a new president. One more question on the, the deduction stuff. So this is yeah. a weird one. What about like a cell phone situation? You use it for business, I was on the phone. For the, the phone. LLC? Yeah. So I, I mean, 100%, right? Like, I mean, I wouldn't let you take 100% of the cell phone, but 100% sure. you could take a part of your cell phone on there. I mean, so I had an Airbnb in my condo and like on my phone all the time, like people messaging me, texting me stuff. So yeah, you could take a percentage of that. Yeah. Okay. And how that percentage based on? I mean, I I use a reasonable test. Like if you use it 20%, like don't, based don't on use. Okay. overstate it, right? But something that's reasonable. Okay, cool. What about utilities? Utilities. Percentage. Yeah. Percentage of those expenses. Yeah. yeah, so this is basically what the schedule on a tax return looks like for a rental property. So at the top, we're saying you made $30,000 of rents. You have advertising, some auto expense, cleaning, insurance, management fees, right? Fully deductible. Your mortgage interest would be a deduction. What's next? Repairs? Is that what that is? Mm -hmm. So repairs is a good one to talk about. So small repairs can be expense. So that's like something that's temporary. Like 
if I paint this wall, maybe that lasts for a couple of years. If I'm renting it, I might have to repaint it every year. If I put in a new floor, that's more <coughs> permanent. That has to be depreciated. Real estate taxes. Yeah, did you question? Um, if we take a step back, so you own the house for 28 years, you depreciate mm -hmm. it. How many times do you want to play for that? What would you get? To We're going to get to that. Okay. Um, taxes fully deductible, depreciation expense, right? So that's, I came up with some number of 7,700. So every single year, I'm gonna get that depreciation of 7,700 to get my net result of $2,200 of taxable income. So I think the, the answer of why it does work, <coughs> depreciation versus paying the tax, in this scenario, this person received $30,000 of income and pay tax on $2,285. In the meantime, right, they're building the value of their assets. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Depreciation is a hard concept to understand because houses appreciate. And right. so in our head, we're like, why would, you, why would you depreciate a house? I mean, it's basically for the wear and tear in the house over the years. Yeah. Did we already kind of go over this slide? I think so. Does anyone have questions on depreciation? Yeah. Uh, well, it just one of those line items on the previous one, the management fee, does that refer to your HOA or if you're paying a property manager? So they'd both be deductible okay. mm -hmm. on the rental property. <clears throat> but not on your primary. I mean, you wouldn't have management fees on your primary, but your HOA is not deductible for your primary. They generally, they generally recommend it to, I guess, thinking about, and I know it depends on the situation, but paying quarterly versus just waiting to the end of the year? Well, there is a penalty if you don't pay quarterly. But that's if you're a certain amount off, right? No. So if you don't pay in 110% of your prior year tax, you're going to get the penalty. 110% of your prior year investment tax? Income tax. Total income tax. 110% of your total income tax yep. from last year. Mm -hmm. So what if, what if this next year is the first year that you've got a that you got a rental. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the biggest benefits is you're getting cash and it's basically tax free. Right, so that's why. So you probably don't need to make estimated payments unless you got a bunch of other income. Right. What happens when the house is paid off? So like, say you have a, just a 15 year mortgage, but the depreciation is 27. You're stoked, right? Cause you have none of this. So you've right. just if got you eleven thousand dollars of cash in your pocket. To pay on the income. Well, no. I mean, you have eleven thousand more of income, mm -hmm. but you're gonna have a lot I mean, more money in your bad. pocket. I'm just wondering what like happens. Like you still get the depreciation. Right. You, yeah, the depreciation continues for twenty seven. No right. You just don't get a deduction for the rental, but for the interest. I mean, people ask me all the time, like, should I keep my mortgage to get yeah. the tax deduction? Mm -hmm. No, you're paying way more money. You're paying way more money to your mortgage company than you are in taxes. Yeah. But to that, like, like a side, like a cousin to that question, like if you're, like, I'm in a tiny house, like a, a carriage house, but it's a studio, it's not going to be my permanent residence. Um, and if you're, like, deciding between <coughs> refinancing on a 15-year loan, it's and, and you know it's eventually going to be a rental, it sounds like it would be better to keep it, or maybe, maybe that's just silly, maybe it's just too deep. Make more money. Make more money. So exactly I mean, always money. make more money. Yeah, okay. Yeah, don't, 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 don't do things for the deduction. Right. Don't do things for the deduction. If it makes Unless sense it's a for you and you, you get a deduction, awesome. Okay. But it needs to do both. So the answer to her question is cash flow is better than paying off the loan? Your taxes only go up if you make more money. Right. So if you want to make less, you'll be taxed less. <laughs> It's, so it's sort of counterintuitive. A lot of this is how do so we, we reduce taxes? We should all be tax? super happy when we get to that 35%. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is a good, this is an aspiration. It's bad, the tax rates are not ever 100%. So anytime you make more money, you might be incrementally giving more to the government, but you're taking home more. Whereas on your mortgage, you're paying 100% of your money, right? They're getting all the money. And you're getting maybe a 20% deduction on that money you don't have. Okay, we're, we're kind of running out of time, so we're going to have to go, go a little bit faster. But I okay. think to your question is that, so if you depreciate an asset, say that you bought it for four hundred, you're depreciating it $14,000 a year. After 27 and a half 
years, you're recapturing the depreciation um, at the sale, which is 25%. Right. Uh, $100,000. Right. This is your hybrid uh, Airbnb basement rental. So, I mean, basically, you are splitting your property into two separate parts. You have one part that's your primary residence that you'll never have tax on. You can sell it. Don't depreciate it. Then you have the other part that you're required to depreciate. It becomes a capital asset. So, yeah, you can take 50% of your mortgage against that income, taxes, utilities, blah, blah, blah. And then when you sell that, you're going to have to recapture the depreciation, and that is going to create a capital gain on your primary residence. And that's based on the actual square footage of Correct. Your, your primary area versus... Exactly. Yeah. So this is this that's example exactly. is pretty good because say that you bought a house for 600000 you divided it up, you're paying $3,000 a month. So you're, this, this person's getting a $27,000 deduction for a single person, which is pretty significant, and it's because they're pairing up the two together. We're going to skip this because we already went over it. Okay. Okay, so 1031 exchange is when you go to, so is an option. So obviously if you have a rental property, <coughs> you can just sell it and you're going to pay the 25% capital gains and you have to pay back the depreciation. When you sell the rental property, when you yes. sell it. Another option to avoid taxes is a 1031 exchange. Um, so there's, so you're avoiding two taxes the recapture on the depreciation of 25% and the capital gains. And the way that you do that is you're just, it has to be like in kind. So if you're selling an investment property to buy another investment property, then you can avoid those two taxes. Does that make sense? So there's so, a- I mean, you're not avoiding them forever. You're deferring them. I, yes. I should say deferring them. So, so it's a good, it's a good, what do you do after 27 and a half years of depreciation <laughs> you lose that expense? you exchange it into a new property. Or if, you're, if you've had appreciation over the first 10 years of depreciation, this is how real estate becomes more powerful, you've had tax savings those 10 years that the property has been going up in value, right. now you can buy theoretically a bigger property, pay no tax, start the whole schedule over again. Um, however, at some point, if you take that money to your checking account, sell a property and it comes to you versus through an intermediary bank here to buy your next property, that's when you pay tax. And one thing that's really important is so when you do a 1031 exchange, your basis never changes really from your initial property. I, that's in the example. Okay, so, sorry. I think if we go through the example. Sure. The important thing to know is that um, if you do a 1031 exchange, you're gonna, uh, you have to put your money from the sale into mm -hmm. a 1031 exchange company. They hold it and they're really good at educating you on, there's a, there's a lot of rules, we're not gonna go over all the rules, but for basic, you know, you have, to, you have to sell it, you have to find a replacement property, identify a replacement property within 45 days and close on it within 180 days. And there's a lot of rules, but the nice thing is that these escrow companies that do 1031 exchanges walk you through the whole process. Um, so, I really think about real estate as a the ROI and real estate. So in simple terms, it's just the rents minus the mortgage equals your cash flow. And so then you divide it and that's what your return is on the money. And that's really important because if you're comparing investments like versus the stock market, I think that you need a way to think about real estate as like what's your annual return on that investment. And it really it really matters how much money you put in it. <coughs> And so a lot of times, like my real estate, uh, the way that I'm gonna build my real estate portfolio is buying primary residences, putting a little bit less money down on those because you can leverage your a lower down payment to get a higher cash on cash return, which is important for this example. And I think that um, I'm gonna use Natalie as my example. So say that Natalie, she bought her first house for 400,000 and she put 10% down so her full cash into the deal is $40,000. Um, a few years later, after two years, she decided to, to buy a new house, and so she rented that property for eight years, and she was able to depreciate it over that eight years, $116,000. Her basis, 
so basis is really important. Um, so her basis, is, so it's the how much she paid for it minus the depreciation, which is a, um, 116,000. So her basis just dropped to 284,000. Keep that in your head. So her return on that investment is about 18%, her cash on cash return. Um, when she goes, then she decides to do a, a 1031 exchange. So she decides to sell that property. Her basis is still 284. Mm -hmm. And she buys a six unit apartment for 1.2 million. Does not add any money into the deal. It's still that same $40,000. The assets appreciated. She puts 20% down on a $1.2 million house. Her rents then are um, 7,500. Her mortgage is 5,500. So she's cash flowing $2,000 a month. Um, so her profit after 10 years is gonna, just from that asset is gonna be $240,000. This is where real estate gets really exciting. So her basis stays the same. She's still depreciating that asset. So is that confusing anyone? Because your basis is, stays the same. So you're only depreciating based on mm -hmm. your basis, 284. the 284. So all of a sudden she dies. Sorry, I forgot that part of the story. <laughs> is that really where it gets good? <laughs> <laughs> For my kid, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, she, she passes away, and then she passes on um, the full asset, say it's $2 million um, by the time she does. So if you really like look at this, her cash flow <coughs> was $300,000 over the 20 years. She depreciated or saved $219,000 on her taxes, which if I just kind of did a basic calculation, it'd be 30%. Um, the benefit ends up being of that full property, like $365,000. So if you divide that by that initial $40,000 investment, her cash on cash return is 4,662% of that $40,000 $40, she originally invested. How is she buying the $1.2 million property if she only had 40K? They got really she, good credit. She 1031 <laughs> exchanged it. So that 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 asset, her original. So I still have a mortgage on the 1.2 million. Yes. Right. And so my mortgage doesn't play any factor in my basis. So I think your question. Uh, How is she affording a 1.2 million dollar property if she only has forty thousand dollars in equity? I'm because it appreciated over it appreciated. 10 years. So really it's worth over eight years. 800,000, right? Was that the number? Yeah, I think I, I thought I put that in there. Yeah, sorry, the asset was, after the eight years of her renting it, I, to do these numbers, I said that it was worth 800,000. Okay. So I'm basically so trading an $800,000 property. Mm -hmm. So I'm trading an $800,000 property yeah. for a $1.2 million property yeah. and a mortgage. Yeah. So the kids, though, it's a huge thing the, for the kids. kids. Are have to pay a massive tax. No, no. 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 the kids die. pay no taxes right. if you die. Now the okay, property. If you don't die, <laughs> if you well, don't die, then you keep it in your name. Death. If our exit strategy is not dying. Then we're <laughs> Ever? To pay. Well, while we're investing. Well, right. So then you don't sell it. Maybe do. It's 1031 to the so it's a, Well, it's a separate, it's, it's more and more attractive to see things appreciate. But at some point, you need to exit this property. You need to exit this property. Then you're going to have to sell it. If you have to sell it, you are going to pay a significant amount of tax right. because of all the depreciation. However, you're only taxed based on how much you've made. It's going to still be favorable for you. To but your basis sorry. is 284000 so if your you, basis is that you sell it, let's just say you sell it for two million, and this is the 1031 exchange property, so you defer taxes and you pay. The bill's gonna be huge. I don't have to do you that. Don't, the but, 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 284 and two million. Yeah, that's you pay 25% on. You pay 25% on 284, not the two million. No, the difference. No, the difference. No. Difference. no. Well, let's, you have to let's, not, let's not like overthink it too much though, because in the scenario it was a forty thousand dollar investment that might end right. up paying two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in tax because you made a million dollars. 
two million or two million, whatever it was. So the tax rates are going to get higher. The, the amount of tax that you'll pay is driven by how much you made. And yes, if you sold this after 20 years and had to cough up a quarter of a million dollars in taxes, that will be a bad check. You won't be happy writing that check until but you think about how much is it. If you made a million dollars earning at a job, you pay a lot more in tax than that. And a huge point about your kids. So if you keep the property as a 1031 in your name, it has to be in your name until you die, and it's will to your kids or goes into an irrevocable trust at that point, your kids get a step up in basis, meaning their cost goes to fair market value on the date of your death. They sell it the next day, they have no tax. What is an LLC? I mean, so an LLC, how we do it as rental properties, you don't get an EIN number. It's not, it's basically filed on your personal return the whole time, same thing. Can I make one point? So, I, I, it's a huge mistake, I think, for people to get an LLC and then get an EIN number. So that's a tax ID number for the LLC. As a rental property, you don't need that. That creates a whole nother entity, and it, it can be, it just costs you more money all the time. So you need the EIN to open a bank account for that property? So you can do it under your social security number. Okay. Just have a separate account under your name, but it's for that property? Yeah, the biggest thing is that it's a separate account. Okay. And it, it can be a disregarded entity, and that can have a separate bank account under your social. Uh, we've been looking into rezoning our property to have an AEU. Oh, that's Cassidy's expertise. So what does that entail with LLCs and is it similar to like a house, primary residence for renting out the basement? How does that work with all that? The ADU, well, it's all considered your primary residence. <coughs> and so if you're using it, for example, as a home office, it's all your primary. Yeah. Um, if you start renting it out, it's that hybrid model again okay. where you would just do a calculation of the square footage and the percentage. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you don't need like a lump sum money, like a million dollars at you know a certain some point time, is it more beneficial to just own it and take the rental income? I mean, it's kind of situational, right? But like, definitely. Um, you're just paying tax. You're paying taxes on that rental income, regardless. But not right? really. Because you can, because there's so many expenses. There's a depreciation and expenses. I mean, in most cases, it's pretty much tax free. Hmm. Yeah. Most rental income, once you if now, you, once you pay it off, you might have a little bit of tax, but you're not going to have crazy amounts. But it doesn't compare to like the capital gains or like the depreciation or whatever tax. I mean, you know, if you're going to make five hundred thousand dollars on the property. Like, yeah, 25% is not that much. When you make $500,000 on our tax brackets, you're paying way more than 25% if you make it as earned income. So even the capital gains, like, yeah, the numbers get big and they get scary, but they're so low. Compared to what you're walking you're, away with. You're making a lot of money. And, like, in France, earned, unearned income, capital gains are 90%. Mm -hmm. What's going to give? France, ninety percent tax on capital gains and unearned income. What's the, what are the attributes that uh, are looked for with a lifetime exchange? Because in this case, a house uh, is exchanged for another house, but it was double the value. So, does value come into play? It has yes, to always be an investment property. It has, it has to be to an be increased more. amount. It right. has to be an arm's length away, so you can't like buy it from your mom um, arm's length or rent it. Yeah, rent it to your kid. You can't do those types of things. But the po point being is, if you were to take out of a single family and then do a ten thirty one exchange and do like a fourplex, like a quad, you can do that. Yeah, as long as it's, it's more. still and you couldn't real, do it to live in it. You couldn't do a ten thirty one and make that your primary residence. You have to rent it for at least a year. Okay. We're gonna. We're. we're <laughs> I know. Poor Andrew. It, That's fine. Andrew, tell us about the buying it within an IRA. Yeah, one thing we do a lot with clients is um, mm -hmm. you can own investment property inside of retirement accounts. Um, it's it is somewhat complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's another one of these arm's length transactions, but um, you can get financing for it. Uh, you still have the same opportunities in terms of putting a certain percentage down and getting borrowed money to to cover the rest. The big difference here 
is that the money always is going to stay inside of your retirement account. So if it's a Roth purchase or a traditional purchase, the rules of those accounts don't change, but the tax code does change. So it's if it's traditional IRA, which is a pre-tax purchase, may, maybe in one example, you just switched jobs and your 401k became available to you to move to an IRA or whatever it is. That IRA could purchase property. The rules of the IRA don't change. The rules of selling the real estate from a tax perspective do change. Keeping it just real short right now, um, that money stays in your retirement account until you're of an age that you're able to distribute it. Everything that we talked about of if you sold that property, a capital gain, that's gone. Um, if, if, if the money will sit in your retirement account until you send it to your checking account, that's when you'll pay tax. If it's traditional, if it's a Roth purchase, you'll never pay tax on that money again um, when it's structured properly. So I, I had a few slides here. We're, we're running low on time. Um, there's a bunch of rules. It's complicated, but it can be done. Um, we have banks in Colorado that lend on them. And if you guys have, um, you know, IRA dollars or Roth IRA dollars, uh, and you're interested in property investment, it is something you can do. And if you're realtors or lenders, and you know of people switching jobs, moving to Colorado, anything that would free up a 401k or some sort of big retirement account, this is another avenue that you might be able to provide some value to them. Um, you can even split it. I have clients that have half the property owned by a traditional IRA, the other half owned by their Roth IRA. It's pretty attractive. Um, but uh, it's it's a highly regulated place. It's allowed everywhere. It's just you need to find the right folks to work with. It's not going to be like the fidelities of the world. You need to find like a smaller type shop that does that stuff. Um, but if you're trying to find assets or dollars to make a down payment, uh, don't ignore what you might have saved in retirement accounts already. So just to clarify on that, um, we just actually were looking into that, but um, the, what you borrow against is no longer earning in the IRA account, correct? What you borrow against? So whatever you, whatever you're borrowing, say you have, you have a mortgage, right? So you take fifty thousand dollars out. That's no longer in the marketplace. It's not earning. It, right. So it's yeah, it's so and it, this would be a trend. You you could leverage an existing investment account to purchase real estate. I'm not s suggesting that in this model. This would be opening up a self-directed IRA, putting in $100,000, and using that $100,000 as a down payment on a purchase. Doesn't um, it have to be a self-directed IRA? It does, it does. And all, that, and all that difference means is that Just it's the, the big custodian guys out there don't want to mess with tracking the value of real estate. So you go to a small IRA company for that. But, um, borrowing against the investment account to make a purchase or borrowing against your 401k would be a totally different scenario. Oh, so it's different. Okay. Yeah, that heavily consider the risks of borrowing against your 401k. So in this case, the IRA owns the property. Yeah. yeah. Not you. Oh, and it has to be very separate. So yeah. I tried to Yeah, and sure. we could go into you a ton of detail here for the sake of time. I'd be more than happy to chat with anyone on the details of it, but just know that, you know, if you've been... All right. 10 years at a job and you've saved your 10% a year to you're doing a good job. If you are looking to do real estate, you may have an avenue to do so with a retirement account. Um, I did have the key of something. I see people posting a sign in front of their house that says, for sale by order. Or I see people on TV claiming to be discount brokers. My rich dad taught me to take the opposite approach. He believed in paying professionals well, and I have adopted that policy also. Today, I have expensive attorneys, accountants, real estate brokers, and stockbrokers. Why? Because if, and I do mean if, the people are professionals, their services should make you money. And the more money they make, the more money I make. We live in the information age. Information is priceless. A good broker should provide you with information as well as take the time to educate you. I have several brokers who do that for me. Some taught me when I had little or no money and I am still with them today. What I pay a broker is tiny in comparison with what kind of money I can make because of the information they provide. I love it when my real estate broker or stockbroker makes a lot of money because that usually means I made a lot of money. A good broker saves me time in addition to making me money. 
like when I bought the vacant land for $9,000 and sold it immediately for over $25,000 so I could buy my portion quicker. A broker is my eyes and ears in the market. They're there every day, so I do not have to be. I'd rather play golf. People who sell their house on their own must not value their time much. Why would I want to save a few bucks when I could use that time to make more money or spend it with those I love? What I find funny is that so many poor and middle class people insist on tipping restaurant help 15 to 20 percent, even for bad service, but complain about paying a broker 3 to 7 percent. They enjoy tipping people in the expense column and stiffing people in the asset column. That is not financially intelligent. Okay, that's that's a really good part of the book if, I, if you're a real estate agent. Um, <laughs> I think it makes sense, but I think that point, like I met Natalie and I had been looking for like a tax someone to like help me with my tax taxes when I opened my own business and um, the first year you saved me like twenty thousand dollars and she saved me because of our situation. She saved me like twenty thousand dollars for the year before. And so like there are so many like thank you. But of course. she's she's just been like really and Andrew's done the same for me. We've run numbers and we've run numbers. He's been really instrumental to helping me buy my ADU. So um, you know, work with professionals, make sure that your CPA, your financial advisor, and your real estate agent, they really know this stuff because otherwise when you're going to make a purchase and you don't quite have the big picture of what this all looks like, then you're, you're not going to be making good financial decisions. Um, so that's what we learned. <laughs> Any questions? I know, sorry, this took... I'm glad you guys participated and it went a little bit longer than I thought. Michael, thank, thank you so much. Something you said before about um, getting fined if you don't pay your taxes quarterly. So if you don't pay 110% of your prior year's tax in the current year, you will have an estimated payment penalty. What happens if you make less money that year? Well, then you, it, that's only if you owe. If you have a refund, then you don't have any penalties. It, it's more significant for people that are not W-2. If you're 1099, you're not paying your income tax quarterly, it's more significant than yeah. your because your tax burden is not that high. Yeah. If you guys have individual Usually, questions, I mean, some people that make a lot. We can break and yeah. you can come to us with individual questions. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, Thank you guys. guys. Taxes are pretty boring, but that was like the most engaged audience I've ever taught a class for. People were so interested and excited and engaged. I'm, just blown away.